to uh, everybody there. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to talk to uh, the, the college again. I spoke to you, I think it was last year. Uh, so it's great to talk to another cohort of uh, students. Um, in this lecture, I'm gonna take you through the work that we've been doing on journalism and AI. And I hope that it um, informs you about the technology, but more importantly, how we think that it can change journalism and how it might be part of your future careers. Um, my name is Charlie Beckett. I am a professor at the London School of Economics in the Media and Communications Department. I run a think tank called POLIS, which is the LSE's journalism think tank. Uh, and that's where we've hosted this project called Journalism AI. Before I joined the LSE, I was uh, a journalist at places like BBC and uh, independent television news in the UK. Uh, before I start, though, I want to introduce you to uh, Lakshmi, who is a colleague of mine working on the Journalism AI project, uh, but she's based in India and has a very strong connection to your college. So Lakshmi, would you like to say hello to everybody? Yeah, thank you, Charlie. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, as um, Charlie just said, I'm Lakshmi. I'm a community coordinator with Journalism AI. Uh, I joined just about a year ago, and it's been a great experience so far at uh, Journalism AI, I help with a lot of online engagement activities uh, like on social media and also with, to engage with the community at large. I also help with project coordination across activities. Um, and I'd uh, love to talk to you, any of you if you're interested in it, you can shoot me an email. I'll get to that at the end of the presentation. I'll hand it back over to Charlie for now. Yeah. And uh, Lakshmi has been doing an absolutely fantastic job because we're, we're very much uh, a project that is trying to be uh, global and uh, we'll be announcing plans soon for the work this year which again will be reaching out across the world to different types of news organizations what i'm going to do now is share my uh, screen so that i can give you a presentation about um, our work so i'm sure you can all see that if you can't you should nod at me now um, so this is an introduction to AI for journalists, and you're all proto-journalists. I've explained who I am. I, I used to be a journalist, but uh, now at the LSE, but I spend all my time uh, working with people in news around the world. Now, the Journalism AI project started three years ago, and uh, our mission, our global mission, is to empower news organizations to use uh, artificial intelligence responsibly. And you can um, define responsibly how you wish. Um, I would say that it's quite simple, really. We, we want to use this technology to make better journalism, to help journalists who are under all sorts of pressures, financial, political, personal uh, pressures to, as they're doing their job. And we want to see if uh, AI technologies can help them to do that incredibly uh, important work that uh, journalists do. On the agenda today, well, we're going to look a bit at what AI is, um, then we're going to think about how it's used in journalism, and then some thoughts about where you might start thinking about how you might use AI uh, in your work and in your, your future work. So the first thing to say about AI is that in its purest sense, it does not exist. There isn't some sort of robot out there that can think in the same intelligent, creative way uh, that a human being can do. The way we think about it is, in th it, 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 as a kind of umbrella of different processes of machine learning, natural language processing, and things like automation. So automation, for example, um, uh, it describes a wide range of technologies. And the idea is that they reduce the human intervention in processes. And by that we mean, in practice, that it does a lot of often very boring tasks that journalists can, um, can use their time better to do other things. Uh, and automation can be done uh, at great scale and very, very uh, quickly. They're driven by algorithms. And algorithms, it sounds very complicated, it's all about computer science, um, but in practice, it's reduced really to a series of quite simple steps that uh, the programme undertakes to usually solve a very particular problem. 
and to accomplish a very defined outcome. Uh, from the outside, AI can look very complicated, uh, but in practice, it works better when it's given quite a uh, simple task to do. Uh, and that's a similar thing with machine learning. This is about computer programs that are trained to understand data sets and they actually learn to perform tasks by observing patterns in the data and predicting uh, outcomes. But they have to be explicitly programmed to do so. They don't make it up by themselves. They can work things out, but they have to be programmed by human beings, by computer scientists uh, to do what we want them to do. So in that sense, AI is a real collection of ideas, technologies and techniques uh, that, result, uh, that relate to uh, a computer system's capacity to perform those tasks that normally require human labor uh, and human uh, intelligence. So um, the idea of general intellig artificial intelligence, as I said, the idea that machines can really function like a human, um, in practice, it's a much more narrow idea of artificial intelligence. And if you want to go deeper into that computer science elements, there's a fantastic course called Elements of AI, which will tell you much more about that. Um, questions I suggest we sort of keep to the end, but you're all good journalists, so make notes. If there's things you don't understand or things you want to query, make a note and we'll come back to it uh, at the end. So how is AI is, is used in journalism? Well, the important thing is that it can impact on all parts of the news process. It can impact on uh, news gathering, for example. So if you work in a newsroom, which you're going to do at some point, uh, that regularly sorts through data to find specific events, for example, or does fact checking, then AI can help. If you're working in news production, you know, that bit when you're actually making videos or content or articles, then AI can help you uh, to sift through uh, the raw materials, if you like, uh, to actually make uh, final products. And perhaps the biggest area is in news distribution. Uh, this idea that you can help people to find the content that's most relevant to them. And that's really important because, as I'm sure you've all experienced, there is an overwhelming amount of sources of information out there and you often have to wade through stuff to get things that are relevant to what you're interested in. It's also very important to your future careers because this is how journalism makes its money, um, or how it justifies itself in that, um, say, for example, you have a subscription model, well, you can use AI technologies to understand what makes people attracted to your uh, content and how do you stop them from cancelling their subscription? How do you have more relevant advertising if that's your funding model? And how do you personalise your content so that people uh, find it very convenient uh, to consume your journalism? So in many ways that's the most important part of it because there's no point creating great journalism if nobody uh, reads it. Um, here's an example uh, of news discovery. This is um, from Reuters who are one of the biggest news agencies in the world, thousands and thousands of journalists around the world, uh, desperately trying to um, look at what's happening on social media, what's happening on the internet, and trying to understand, for example, whether something has happened. You know, uh, if somebody tweets a picture of a bomb going off, um, how do the journalists find out about that? Well, they've created these systems which sift through social media and the internet generally to alert the human journalists when they think that something's happening and help them to gather the material to make their, their content. So that's a really good example of a, a big uh, news organisation. Here's an example of a much smaller news organisation, um, which was called, I think that's right, actually they're called Testy, aren't they? Um, Texty, Texty, an organisation, fun enough, um, based in uh, Ukraine, of all places, um, pre-war, of course, and they used uh, artificial intelligence to investigate a story about people who were mining for amber, you know, the semi-precious stone. They were doing it illegally. And so they used satellite imagery. They used artificial intelligence to comb through vast amounts of satellite imagery to identify where this illegal activity was happening. And so those are both great examples of how 
the AI technology is helping the journalism uh, to be more efficient and much more effective. And then when we think about news production itself, um, here's a good example from Washington Post, which of course is a mega uh, tech savvy organization. You probably know that it's uh, owned by a guy called Jeff Bezos, who's quite clever when it comes to tech as the boss of uh, Amazon. And in this case, it's quite a kind of humdrum uh, example. It's high school football results. Simple reports on high school football matches in the States. Uh, something that you wouldn't want to have hundreds of journalists spending their time doing very simple formulaic uh, reports. So they managed to uh, automate this with story technology called Heliograph. And that does this very hyper-local coverage. So every high school football match, where it's reported, where there's a data source, they can automate the coverage of it. And that will make, you know, a couple of hundred parents and high school uh, students very happy because the Washington Post is reporting on their, their sport. And there's lots of other things that can do, like helping uh, understand quotes, for example, The Guardian, uh, based in London, but now very much global, using uh, data science uh, to work out what a quote is and whether they want to, to use that. Uh, and some examples from news distribution, um, the Financial Times, they're a very clever global news organization, and they're very interested in predicting uh, trending topics. So they're trying to use AI uh, to comb through uh, online data, but also looking at uh, what people are reading on their websites to identify the topics that people are interested in. Because if, if they can see that somebody's interested in, for example, uh, the Ukraine war, then they'll create more content to satisfy that demand. And here's another great example from the South China Morning Post um, out there in Hong Kong, where they were using AI uh, technology to build recommender systems. You probably notice when you go online uh, to read news, you often see at the bottom of the article, it suggests related articles. Well, this is an attempt to make this um, even more sophisticated so that it tries to take you on a journey. If you're interested in a particular subject, it will recommend other articles that might give you more context or might give you a more personal view or an opinion piece about that, that topic. And again, all automated and lots of other clever ways uh, that you can use technology. This is the Pudding, an independent website in the States. Um, they used AI to identify the representation of, of women in the news. And again, that's interesting from a sort of ethical perspective, a political perspective, but it's also really important because as we all know, women make up half the world. And if you're not doing stories and you're not representing them, then they're not gonna be interested in your journalism. Some of you may be aware of the, the, the huge investigation into the Mauritius leaks. This was the big banking story where somebody had leaked vast data sets uh, of banking records. And they were able to use this information to tell stories about corruption, about the way that uh, very important people were hiding uh, their money. Now they couldn't have done this without AI because they had these vast data sets and if they physically had gone through as human beings and looked at every single document, they would have probably spent the next 50 years uh, combing through this. So they were able to use AI to at least sieve through it to signal where the most interesting uh, documents were and then the human journalists were able then to turn that into uh, real stories. So you're getting the point now that uh, AI, generally speaking, uh, is doing either is doing journalism that you wouldn't really want to do if you just spent your time at the Asian College of Journalism. You want to do real uh, journalism or it's helping you to do uh, that exciting, more creative, investigative type journalism. And all those examples have in common that the newsrooms were trying to solve a problem. Like, how do we report on high school football matches? Well, we could appoint a reporter to each high school, but that'd be crazy. Uh, so AI was the most effective way to find a solution to that problem. You don't just create, you don't just use the AI because it's sexy and shiny and trendy. And the other big point is that uh, all those programs were based on data, a lot of data. And that's really important when you think about, for example, 
um, how are you going to use AI in a country like India? There are vast data sets in India, but are they reliable? Are they accessible? Um, are you able to create your own data sets? One of the problems is a lot of the data sets that this technology is based on are often Western centric. You know, they're created in California, in Silicon Valley. Um, so how can we create data sets that are relevant to what we want to do? Now, if you go onto our AI journalism website, you'll find our wonderful case studies fire, which is interactive. Uh, Lakshmi has been working away trying to keep this up to date as well. There are loads of examples where you can find uh, examples, including from in India, about where people are using AI. So far, so good. So if you're thinking about this, and you may well be thinking about, well, how is this going to be part of my journalism life in the future? Where do you start? Well, the big picture, I'll do the big picture first, and then we'll focus in a bit more. But the big picture for people thinking about using AI is, yes, define your objective. What, it, what, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Or what is the challenge or opportunity that you've identified? Um, then make sure that you do understand these key concepts. You know, what does machine learning really mean, for example? You don't have to be able to code for that, but you should at least understand uh, what it is. You know, have a look at how other people are using it. This is kind of new tech, but a lot of it has been around for quite a while. So there are lots of uh, um, examples out there. Think about the data uh, that you need. Think about the skills that you need. Obviously, you as students think about, well, have I got the knowledge and expertise to uh, use some of these tools? Would I, if I'm in a newsroom where they are being used, would I understand them? Um, so that's important to think about. And finally, think about the risks and the risks can vary all the way from uh, kind of algorithmic bias, perhaps, to simply that you spend a lot of time uh, trying to use these tools and they're not actually very effective. So with the Journalism AI project, but we fully recognise that there are limits and drawbacks to, um, to this technology. The reason we know about this um, is because back in 2019, uh, we did this big report based on a survey of newsrooms around the world and looking at how they they use AI and the problems they encountered and the innovation they were doing. And um, we put it into this report, which you're welcome to look at. And since then, we've been making sure that we've been keeping up uh, with the developing trends because around the world in all sorts of other sectors like pharmaceuticals, security, retail, they are all using AI increasingly. You know, you're thinking about banking, for example, increasingly uh, fintech finance is driven uh, by AI technology. So, you know, why should the news industry be any different? But when, you, when we've looked at it, when we, when we spend all our time talking with news organizations about this, the, 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 key, the key things that they say to us about the effect one of them is uh, that there's going to be this big change to the structures and cultures. And for you lot, as students thinking about careers in journalism, this is going to mean you, you might well be applying for jobs like this. So instead of applying to be, um, you know, a foreign correspondent or a political correspondent or reporter um, or an agriculture reporter, uh, you may be applying for jobs like these. These are all vital now. Um, to the way that news works, and they're all related in, to some degree uh, to AI technologies. And for some of these people, they're going to come from a data science or computer science background. Others will be editorial uh, journalists who have learned about the tech and learned to work with people who are savvy about it. So that's our, our kind of overview of the technology and how it's implemented and how it works. Um, loads more uh, information on our website. There are um, really good training courses which will introduce you uh, to uh, basic concepts like machine learning, um, even to how to do a bit of machine, le machine learning and data training yourself. Um, so feel free, it's all free, it's all open and accessible. And we also have uh, lots of workshops which are open to people. We have a festival at the end of the year that you can join. Um, so we're really keen, especially as, as 
journalists going into the field, perhaps some of you already got experience as well, we're really keen uh, to hear how it might work for you and what kind of expectations you have. So I'll, I'll stop there and um, welcome any uh, questions or comments that you have. Thank you so much, Charlie. Um, I've already said uh, your research papers, uh, your study of the newsrooms in the 2021 study, everything with the students, and uh, they have an idea about that. So, any guys, any questions? I had a question. Go ahead, please. Yeah. So, I just wanted to know that how affordable is it for newsrooms in India to you know, use AI? Well, I'll get actually to come back on that one actually as well. Um, one of the key issues we've identified is inequalities around this. Um, there are inequalities around any technology because obviously, especially when they're quite new, the people who've got a big budget for R&D, who've got a big revenue anyway, you know, the bigger news organizations. We mentioned some there, the Reuters, the Washington Posts. Indeed, you know, in an Indian context, you know, um, the Times of India, for example, they're gonna have the resource partly because they're used to doing this. They did it, they had to go online in the first place. They then perhaps had to develop social media tools. They might well have an IT department. So for them, it's somewhat easier. And some of the benefits, I mentioned some of those uh, tools they very much operate at scale so there is a kind of inequality and you know one of the things that we've worked on in the last year and will, will be going forward is looking more at smaller newsrooms so for example in India there is a real kind of blossoming of smaller digital independent news organizations and so we've been trying to um, engage with them uh, and I think the the simple, not the simple answer, but the realistic answer is, like with other technological ways, over time, it will kind of cascade and that people will come up with, they are already coming up with the tools that smaller newsrooms can identify and use. I don't know, Lakshmi, from an Indian perspective, do you want to add anything to that, Lakshmi? Um, Charlie, what you've said is uh, what I was thinking of too. Uh, in terms of uh, the newsrooms that I've been using it so far, you see more, mostly the bigger newsrooms like HD and as Charlie had mentioned, Times of India and um, the Quint, which is kind of a small, smaller one, but it's also a more established newsroom. Um, a big part of it has to do with uh, the amount of funding that they get for uh, something like this. And it's only the bigger newsrooms that have the uh, deep pockets to you know, experiment and also fail and then experiment again. I mean, one thing to bear in mind is that um, we are already using kind of algorithmically driven artificial intelligence. I mean, every time you search on Google, for example, you know, that is a form of machine learning. It's based on well, vast data sets. So as journalists, we're already, you know, however big our organization is, we are already you know, using these tools even without thinking about it. But yeah, that if you if you look at some of the case studies on our website and so on, increasingly uh, dealing with smaller organisations, and we've also set up something called the uh, AI Academy for Small Newsrooms, which we started last summer, where we brought um, I can't remember how many it was. If actually, I think that was it, ten different news organisations who did a course over the summer, and that was a very good learning experience for us. To hear about what their expectations of AI um, are, you know, it's a really good question. Yeah, I have a question, Charlie, if you don't mind. I uh, would love to know how AI is this technology is being used uh, by Facebook, Twitter in fact checking in the area of fact checking. Yeah, it's a really good one. Um, that's a really good example. And obviously, there are lots of other organizations that are using it for fact checking. Um, you know, the fact checking organizations like, um, I think it's called Fact Check UK, which obviously is based in UK, but they have actually created um, automated tools for fact checking, which at least alert them to when there are sort of memes on social media, for example, that are containing disinformation and that that then allows them 
um, to use their human knowledge to make a judgment. Because as I'm sure you're all aware, it's really hard to tell when something is so-called fake news. So if I make a joke about somebody on online and it's obviously not true, well, is that disinformation or is that just a joke? Machines aren't so good at spotting those things. Um, humans have to sort of back it up with editing. But because of the volume, the sheer volume of information that flows through Facebook and Twitter and everything else, um, you've got to start somewhere. And it would be, I think, literally impossible to have the kind of social media that you want. You know, if you want, if you want open Facebook, open Twitter, where you're able to post stuff without somebody checking it first, um, then you have to accept there's going to be this huge volume of material constantly being generated on platforms like TikTok, you know, and the first step to at least trying to identify the, the bad stuff, if you like, has got to be automated. And that's what the, um, that's what the platforms are doing, you know, Facebook, Twitter, etc., are trying, you know, so you've probably seen um, on Twitter, you get that thing, don't you, that comes up saying, um, what is it, this is not a confirmed source, or you may wish to pause before you read this because it's been flagged up as incendiary or something, you know. Um, so I think it's a, a classic example of a kind of combination. You know, I'm quite realistic. I don't expect to um, purify our information systems of all the bad stuff. Um, or I think it's an, an endless war. <laughs> it's an endless struggle, uh, including on mainstream media, frankly, um, which isn't always um, pure, is it? Um, and AI can at least help you with that process, but it's definitely not some magical solution. Anybody else? So I had I had one more question. Go ahead. How can we use AI? So for example, if there's a government data set which has you know missing data. So is AI useful when it comes to that, like finding out inaccuracies? especially in countries like India, where, you know, the data is not collected properly. So is there something that AI can help us additionally? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Again, you know, AI can only um, work with the data that it's given. You know, that's the, the limitation on it. And you have to be very careful that if it's like in any kind of journalism, say, for example, you're writing a story, and you ask five people for their opinion. Well, obviously that's a data set. You've got five people's opinion, but you'd try and check, wouldn't you, that they were five very different people, you know, that they were somehow representative. And it's the same with uh, data sets. You know, you may have a record of, um, you know, the number of people who have been prosecuted for sexual assault in, you know, a certain Indian state. Well, then of course, as an intelligent journalist, you would think, well, I'm gonna check, these are police records. Do they, do they reflect the reality of that? Have they recorded all the sexual assaults that have happened or do they just record it where there's been a, a prosecution? Are they up to date? Um, can I, how, do I, how does that compare with the reality? And I think that's an interesting part that the, the AI can help you to sift through um, official records and it can you know, highlight uh, when those are in, inadequate, um, but it can also make the journalist perhaps more thoughtful and critical about the evidence that they have. When I was a young journalist, I used to go along to police stations and I was told by the police officers, you know, what the crimes were that were happening. Well, I could easily have gone out on the streets and asked people as well. And I think uh, AI, using AI is not a replacement uh, for human journalism. If anything, I think it encourages us to also get out of our offices, get away from our screens, and try and see what's really happening. And then, interestingly, perhaps you can see uh, there may be uh, contradictions between the official data and what is really happening uh, in the real world. So you have to be careful. And you, the, the best solution is always, of course, to try and create your own data sets. And if you're interested, there's a very interesting organization in the UK called the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. 
and they've done a lot of terrific work trying to um, take crime, for example. In the UK, uh, data sets on crime go according to a court or a police authority. So they're all varied and mixed. And one of the things the Bureau did was just try and work really hard to understand those data sets and to try and aggregate them so they could get a proper picture. And that took a lot of work by some very clever computer scientists working with journalists to do it. But once they'd done that, they were then able to come up with some really interesting uh, stories that reflected the situation in some of those uh, localities. So it's hard work, you know. Some things are much easier, you know. It's like in, in all journalism, certain topics like crime, for example, is always gonna be very controversial and contentious. Um, other um, evidence is um, not more easily gathered, but perhaps it's less uh, controversial. And we've just been through a pandemic, haven't we, where uh, journalists, especially data journalists, uh, who have been using AI brilliantly to update the information we've been getting about the pandemic, but they've had to be very thoughtful and critical about the information that they're basing uh, their results upon, as I'm sure you're really aware of in India, you know. Also, there's this issue of data privacy. So if in future there's a crackdown on social media companies on the data, how will that affect newsrooms that are using, you know, that are capturing data? Like how do you think data privacy will affect AI in the future? Yeah, another good question. Um, at the moment, it's a bit of a dirty secret. You know, at the moment, um, news organizations, for example, collect a lot of data about, for example, their subscribers. When you subscribe to a news, you know, channel, news source, that you become a member of it or you subscribe to it, in the terms and condition, there'll be something hidden away which says that they're allowed to use your data and they'll use it in a, you know, they'll use it to try and give you the best content, to try and understand who you are, what you're interested in, and to make sure they give you uh, the stuff you want, which is all very positive. Um, but they do know stuff about you, you know. Um, at the moment, I don't think it's a, a major issue, and I don't think the regulation is going to have a huge impact. But I do think it's something uh, that news organisations have to be aware of. They also have to be aware of the other data that they might use. And I mentioned, obviously, a lot of it is publicly available, you know, criminal records, health statistics, that kind of stuff, um, you know, football scores. You know, this is all publicly available, it's nothing secret. But there is a really interesting field there, which is, and journalists should be quite good at this, because obviously, as journalists, we often get data that we're not supposed to have. You know, we get things leaked to us which we make a case that it's in the public interest. And so I think that's a really interesting debate going forward around AI technologies is when you hand over the responsibility to the algorithms and the machines, you know, have you done your duty of care? Have you been thoughtful about, well, obvious things like data leaks and so on, but just about the responsibility you have around um, the data that you're using and gathering? Uh, Darshan, you have a question? Uh, yes, sir. I just, hello, sir. So I just wanted to ask, uh, like, as a emerging journalist and with AI and metaverse, what do you think the young journalists like us should be prepared of with the skills that we need? Yeah, well, I think it's, um, in some ways, I mean, I'd go right back, I mean, I was once a young journalist <laughs> and um, when I was a young journalist we had this weird stuff coming along called digital technology which meant that you could instead of using videotape you could edit on a computer which you do routinely you can do it on your smartphones now and I made sure that as a filmmaker I understood it and used it and gosh it was fantastic I made a huge documentary um, that had to be changed overnight at the last minute. And thank God it was digitally edited rather than videotape editing, because I was able to do that. So that's my first thing, which is go experiment. I remember when Twitter first came along, 
um, I thought, okay, I'm going to get on this and just experiment with it and become familiar with it. So I think that's, even if it doesn't become your whole thing, your whole life, there's a very good journalist uh, called uh, Sophia Smith Gaylor, who now works for Vice, was at the BBC, and she's done amazing work on TikTok, even though her BBC bosses didn't want her to do it. They said, you're wasting your time. What is this thing? Who cares? It's just dance and lip syncing. Now we know that TikTok is one of the biggest platforms, even for news and a lot of disinformation. So now the BBC has decided it's going to go on TikTok. And of course, TikTok is algorithmically driven. It's a kind of, it's very much part of this package of technology. So unless you understand that and get a feel for that, then you as a journalist are going to be missing a huge space. I don't mean you have to do journalism on TikTok, but experimenting with these things, getting a taste for it, getting a sense of how it works, and then understand it. Now, again, you don't have to do a huge course about this. I mean, the, the, the introductory courses that we've got are like, I don't know, half an hour, an hour. But just getting yourself across it a bit so you understand the terminology, you know, so you understand the basic concepts in the same way that, you know, when um, social media happened, journalists had to realize you know what it meant to tweet that you were doing a personal message to the world and that even if you deleted your tweet somebody could find it you know um, becoming familiar with those things I think is just going to be part of the package now the other bit of it is if you are the guy or woman sorry who is digitally savvy and understands a bit of how these technologies are going to reshape the newsroom it might give you all sorts of interesting career opportunities you know, you might be able to put together a team of investigative journalists who are going to work with the data scientists on a big project, you know, that you, would, you wouldn't be able to do on your own or as, you know, a simple kind of human journalist. So there are kind of opportunities for you. Uh, it may be, for example, that by understanding audience data that you're given, you're better able to understand how you can make your journalism more effective. You know, should you be using different imagery different headlines because you know I'm guessing that as journalists you want to be read or listened to or watched you know that's why I became a journalist it wasn't because I just wanted to hide in a corner so understanding this this world um, where this technology is so influential I think is is just really important as a starter you know and of course finally you, you may be reporting on it you may be reporting on you know, how your government is using facial recognition uh, to identify people and then perhaps arrest them. Well, it's quite important that you understand how that tech works. My analogy is always, uh, it's like driving a car. You know, I can drive a car. I know how it works. I can, you know, use it to take me places, but I don't really know how the internal combustion engine works. You know, I know enough about it to be able to use the car uh, to do what I want. Thanks. Anybody else? I have a question. Yes, you did, go ahead. Uh, you, yeah. Uh, so you mentioned how uh, news organizations have started using AI for uh, recommending news stories to its, uh, uh, they are, uh, they are consumers. So I, the question is basically, we have seen how this, uh, these kind of practices have uh, been applied in social medias and how that have created echo chambers all around. So how ethical it is uh, for news organizations to add on to this issue and, uh, you know, create echo chambers within news, uh, within news media. Yeah, no, this is a, you know, this is a very important question that keeps coming back. This idea that if you give people what they want, then they'll never consume anything else. You know, that they'll only consume stuff of the same political perspective or from their own region, uh, and they won't have an open mind. Um, it's a slightly controversial opinion, but I don't think it's a problem. I, uh, there's a few reasons for this. Firstly, I think that most of the things like polarization, like conflict, you know, when you think of religious conflict in India and so on, that was all happening before social media came along. 
sometimes social media can amplify some of these um, uh, bad things, but most of them have causes from real things like politicians or activists who deliberately foment this. Um, secondly, most of the evidence is that people who are online, there's a slight difference here, it depends what you mean by online. In India, for example, as you know better than me, there's a huge issue around closed apps like WhatsApp, you know, which are used to promote conflict and hatred and stuff and fake news. Um, but wider, open, more open social media, the evidence is that people who consume their news on that are at least exposed to more diverse views. The real problem that the people who sit there and watch um, cable TV, <laughs> they just watch one channel that panders to their you know opinions and they never see anything else but the evidence is that the people who are online tend to at least see or are exposed to different points of view now how they react to that is a different matter you know um but at the moment i think a much bigger bigger problem especially for news organizations as opposed to facebook and so on is that if you are producing good content how do you get it to people rather than them consuming a bunch of other stuff that's low quality or divisive and so on? And I think that's been remarkably successful, actually. You know, you will choose. We are all to a degree in a filter bubble. None of us can consume everything all the time. That's, you know, and that's quite natural and normal and human, you know? Um, you are interested in certain things. I don't know what your favourite cricket team or football team is, but, you know, I'm a West Ham fan. I do not want to consume news about Manchester United and Manchester City, you know? I really don't. Um, occasionally sometimes, but, you know, give me my West Ham news, please. And that may apply to where you live. You know, of course, you may have a global perspective and you want some international news, but you uh, have a particular perspective of you, where, you, where you live. And at the moment, the, the biggest challenge is to give people that. You know, people feel overwhelmed. They go online and there's all this stuff. Um, so helping people to um, have a healthy diet starts by working with what they're interested in. You know, there's no point trying to force people to consume stuff they don't want to. So, I mean, other people will disagree with me on this, you know, but I'm, uh, I think from a newsroom perspective, I don't think that's a big problem at the moment. You know, the idea of, for, of confirmation bias and filter bubbles, you know. I have another question, which um, actually Lakshmi tried to answer during the last workshop, but uh, I think we ran out of time about, uh, you know, when the moment you mentioned AI, what comes to a lot of people's mind, at least in this country, is uh, uh, GPT-3. You know, something that writes for you so that you don't have to write. And uh, she tried to mention some problems with uh, GPT-3. And could you just elaborate on that, uh, Lakshmi, if you don't mind, please? Yeah, sure. So um, I think last time I was talking about the article that The Guardian had written using GPT-3, where they uh, said that, for context, where they had said that the entire article was generated by AI, which is using GPT-3. Uh, the problem with that was, uh, if you actually really looked at it, they edited the entire piece. So GPT-3 generated multiple versions of the story and they edited it, human edited it, and put it together to form a sequence. So there was a lot of information left out. Like you don't know what the actual uh, GPT-3 generated for one particular story. Not just that, I also think that uh, there is, uh, GPT-3 is not known for, there is bias in the language that it uses as well. So um, that's something that's known as well. So that was what I was trying to get to in, in that conversation. Thank you, because we you ran out of time then. Anybody else? Hello, hello, hello. Uh, I think uh, that's just about it, uh, Charlie. But thank you so much for taking time, and it's been wonderful as ever. And um, it would be great if you could uh, share your. Uh, 
slide deck with us uh, so that I can circulate among the students. And uh, do you mind sharing me, me sharing your email or uh, Lakshmi's email with uh, them? No, please do. Um, it's, it's been great to talk to you guys. And um, as Lakshmi said, get in touch with Lakshmi particularly. Go online. We've got things. We've got the newsletter that you can sign up for. We've got yeah. a Telegram group you can sign up for. So we're very keen to hear from you. Also very keen to hear from you in a year's time when you're out there or a couple of years time when you're out there actually in newsrooms. Uh, keep in touch and let us know whether this tech is uh, affecting your work at all. Thanks very much, Dave. Thank you so much, sir. Thank, thanks, Lakshmi. Thanks for taking time. Go on. Have a nice day.